friends, welcome back to Lingering on the Lectionary, where we reflect on the life of the churches, the local academy, and the rhythm of the church's liturgy. Thanks for being here. Today I talk with Dr. Simon Gathercole about his recent work on the canonical and non-canonical gospels, the distinctiveness of the apostolic message preached among the earliest churches, and the role of theological analysis in New Testament studies. Thanks for listening. Well, welcome, Dr. Gathercole. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to discuss some of your work in the Gospels and early Christian literature. But before we uh, jump into our discussion, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your teaching and research areas? Sure. Uh, Simon Gathercole, my, t- my sort of university title is Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Literature. No, that's not right. Uh, mm-hmm. Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and um, so I teach broadly in those sort of two areas of the canonical New Testament and especially second century. So, f- for example, you know, for the last few years, we've been running a course on Jesus and Paul in the second century, uh, which I've taught with a colleague. And uh, in addition to that, I've I've taught um, you know everything from Jesus and the Gospels to Greek set, Greek set texts uh, in the New Testament. Uh, I'm mainly responsible for a th- third year paper called um, New Testament Christology, um, where we sort of put together some of the pieces that our students have covered individually mm-hmm. in the previous two years. So th- those are the those are my main teaching areas. And you work with doctoral students as well. Yeah, yeah. Again, it, across a wide range of stuff. So I've supervised PhDs on the Dead Sea Scrolls, on Hebrews, Luke, Matthew, Romans, Galatians. Yeah, uh, pretty much everything. I don't think I've seen, I haven't supervised a uh, PhD on the book of Revelation. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe for when I'm grown up. <laughs> yeah, there's so some life goals there. Um, <laughs> Well, this summer, your book, The Gospel and the Gospels, Christian Proclamation and Early Jesus Books, came out with Erdman's, uh, which seemed to be the culmination of some of your work over the last few years. Uh, So maybe as we get started, uh, let me ask you this. uh, What would you say are some of the core claims that you make in the book? And then, you know, maybe what are you hoping to accomplish with this kind of project? Well, yeah, the core core aims are actually summarized. uh, in a number of places um, during the book, and I've summarised them really as a series of uh, uh, as a series of theses. Uh, so I hope these are sort of fairly straightforward, and although we can obviously get into unpacking them later. But thesis one is that the four New Testament Gospels share key elements of theological content that mark them out from most of the non-canonical Gospels. And thesis two, the second proposition is that the reason why the four New Testament Gospels are theologically similar to one another is that they, unlike most others, follow a pre-existing apostolic creed or preached gospel. So those are the two main claims in the book, and that they're they're closely connected, but they're not quite the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so one of the things uh, you focus in on the theological component, Um, Mm -hmm. in the scholarly discussion, you note some of the main alternative strategies for differentiating the Gospels, like uh, dating from the Apostolic Age or attestation in patristic writings and manuscripts or the narrative or non-narrative genre of these texts. But you argue that each of these characters are close, but not quite able to achieve uh, the task that you're going for. Would you, say, would you say that's a correct assumption of what you're doing here, or do you see any of those other factors carrying more weight than any of the others? Or- yeah, I do. I do think some of them have got uh, some usefulness. I mean, I, I mean, my main aim in that section, in just right at the beginning, where I discuss ways in which scholars have previously differentiated between canonical and non-canonical gospels, was really to sort of make it clear what I was doing that was different from what others have done. I, I, um, it wasn't really so much to disparage previous attempts. I mean, I do think that there are. Uh, differences of chronology uh, between the uh, canonical gospels on the one hand and the non-canonical gospels on the other. There are important ways in which I think the canonical gospels reflect the culture of first century Palestine in a way that, uh, you know, other gospels tend not to. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
uh, in terms of you know the number of times they're quoted. Uh, the canonical gospels are quoted far more than uh, any of the others. And so, so, so some of those are, are I think, valid. I, I just choose not to go into them. You know, that they would be individual books on their own, and others, others have written those books. Um, so, uh, I wanted to draw attention to what I thought was a, a really crucial. Uh, point of difference between the canonical gospels and the non-canonical gospels, namely what their theologies are and in particular how they understand the good news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would you say too the um, uh, some of these other areas and the theology component as well is that there's uh, on one hand a uh, task that has to take place of an analysis of the data or just the, the evidence and then some of the difference comes in, not necessarily or what the evidence is, but how that evidence is interpreted for kind of the larger question. Yeah, certainly in some of those cases, um, we've we've got scholars who are really looking at the same information and coming out with quite radical different interpretations. So, so uh, if you you know some scholars like um, Scott Charlesworth, for example. Uh, who's a papyrologist, uh, looks, you know, assesses the number of manuscripts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and uh, says, you know, there's, there's, there are a lot more manuscripts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John than there are of of the others, uh, which, which are true. You know, most of the other, most of the non-canonical gospels only survive in, in fragments, in translations of the original not the original themselves and uh in small numbers of, of fragments as well um whereas you know from the second al already from the second and third centuries we've got you know a couple of dozen manuscripts of matthew a couple of do dozen manuscripts of john so that that that's one way of, of of looking at it on the other hand uh someone like uh, bart herman draws attention to the fact that uh, in in the cases of the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Thomas, we've got three fragments from pretty early on, um, whereas uh, when they at least when uh, he was writing, there was only one early fragment of Mark. Mm -hmm. It's now another early fragment of Mark that's recently been published. But um, so so if you if you compare say Mark with the Gospel of Thomas, then the attestation of, of manuscripts is not so wildly different, at least in the in the very early period. I think that's a helpful a helpful perspective as you're thinking about that that connection between evidence and then the interpretation of that evidence. This is kind of similar to this, but like when you're thinking about the broader field of New Testament scholarship, you mentioned in your introduction and conclusion uh, that some scholars overemphasize the differences between the canonical and non-canonical gospels and others overemphasize the similarities uh, between the canonical and, and non-canonical gospels. Um, not necessarily like it's a, a strict division because most are recognizing uh, both, but there's a tendency to uh, overemphasize either differences or similarities. And so as I moved from chapter to chapter through uh, your book, I noted this concern for balance and trying to follow the nature of the evidence as much as possible. Uh, you know, going, trying to go where it leads. Um, so as, as you're thinking about that idea, uh, those maybe those two extremes or just kind of uh, what you were trying to do, balancing, maintaining that balance, uh, what were some of the ways that you sought to do that? Mm. Um, and did you, perhaps did you find any particular text easier or more difficult to do that with? Mm. Yeah, well, I think the, the key thing when you're, uh, discussing difference and similarity. In other words, when, whenever you're comparing two things, you need to be clear about what tool or criterion you're using to compare them. So you could say that, um, you know, Karl Marx's communist manifesto is a bit like Josephus's account of the Jewish war. Um, because I'm sure you could find certain similarities with it, but on the other hand, you could draw, you could, you you, you could certainly um, draw lots of comparisons about how they're different as well. So I suppose if we take a, f a familiar example like Matthew and Mark, mm -hmm. 
you know, most Christians and certainly most scholars would say that Matthew and Mark are similar. But just to say that they're similar is not really a meaningful statement because we we need to make it clear in what in what respects we are saying that they're similar. And New Testament scholars usually mean by saying they're similar that they, they're, they're similar in the order of events that they present, uh, the sequence, the chronology, on the one hand, and secondly, in terms of the detailed overlap of you know, of, of, of wording. Mm-hmm. Um, so in those two respects, uh, Matthew and Mark are, are similar. And those are quite important respects when one comes to, you know, telling a story about how the canonical gospels emerged, about, mm-hmm. you know, what a solution to the synoptic problem might be. Um, but on the other hand, if, 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 you were a, um, if you were an ancient scribe, uh, then you might not think that Matthew and Mark were so similar because uh, an ancient scribe is paid p- by, you know, by the line and Matthew's a lot longer than Mark. Mm-hmm. And so as far as, you know, doing a job uh, of a scribe is concerned, Matthew is quite different from Mark because, it, you know, it takes a heck of a lot longer to copy out Matthew than it does to copy out Mark. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that, you know, from the point of view of the person who's who, who's having the job of copying them out, Matthew is much more like John mm-hmm. uh, than it is like Mark. So, so you you need to have a, a rather than just saying, you know, X is like Y or X is totally unlike Y. You know, not, neither of those statements are of any use really. Uh, mm-hmm. You need to be you, you need to be able to say in what respects uh, X is like Y and in what respects X is unlike Y. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was. Uh, I thought that that was uh, very insightful as I was working through uh, that particular chapter. As you're thinking about um, the, depending on what the uh, you call it the comparator, the uh, the criteria or the thing that you're uh, comparing and contrasting with, it kind of creates some strange bedfellows uh, depending on what that uh, is. And I liked what you said about how it's uh, if you just say Matthew is is mu- very much like Mark it's not a meaningful statement or better it's incomplete uh, yeah there's yeah. A, there's an ellipsis there there's something there's several steps that are missing uh that make that a, a better discussion mm-hmm. um as you're thinking about articulating the theological criteria that you use to compare the gospels you interact with the uh, the notion that one's chosen criteria usually comes from a given scholar's own specific interests which uh which thing that you're using to compare these texts with in a negative sense idiosyncratic or mm. maybe from a confessional context or uh, from an, a purely academic context mm. uh, so ha- maybe how do you address this particular issue maybe the uh, charge of arbitrariness we could call it when you make the case for the apostolic preaching of the gospel as an appropriate comparator for this type of study yeah well i think the first the first thing to say on that is that there's nothing wrong with a scholar choosing their own particular interest uh mm-hmm. comparing one text with another with respect to what they say about a particular thing so scholars do that all the time um scholars you know many scholars have have chosen the theme of politics and compared um paul's uh, attitude to the roman state with the book of revelations approach to the Roman state and drawn similarities and uh, and different drawn contrasts and similarities between between the two or um, the scholars have compared uh, the different gospel writers attitude to gender or wealth or um, Roman Roman dominion or whatever whatever it might be so mm-hmm. so so there's nothing wrong with choosing a particular interest that that one has you know uh, Again, in the modern context, you know, lots of scholars have compared different perspectives that different New Testament authors have on slavery, for example. Um, and that and that's fine. So, in in one respect, um, you know, I'm just I'm I'm perfectly entitled to write um, a, a book about whatever. Right. <laughs> um, but I do think I do think it's not just uh, a, an idiosyncratic choice that. Uh, that's that's something that i happen to be interested in uh 
and that's why I argue in the book that there's a certain salience uh, um, that there's certain import, a certain importance to this theme of what I call the apostolic kerygma, um, mm-hmm. kerygma being a technical term for the preached gospel or the the early Christian message. And the reason why I think that that's an important theme is that all the early Christians uh, thought that they had a saving message of Jesus about about Jesus, um, and that goes for. Um, the canonical authors as well as the apocryphal the apocryphal writers as well uh, but what i'm doing is sort of drilling down and identifying the the earliest or what i think is the earliest uh, apostolic mm-hmm. kerygma um, namely the one in uh, encapsulated in a number of places in the new testament especially in 1 corinthians 15 that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures and then he appeared to the apostles and and, and other disciples so sort of drilling down and finding that earliest apostolic message i think highlights the fact that that apostolic message both by virtue of its great antiquity that it goes right back to the beginning of the apostolic preaching and by virtue of the fact that it's very widely spread across the earliest christian literature uh, highlights the the importance of the historical importance of this theme Mm -hmm. not just its importance for me personally Mm -hmm. um so as I say, what, what, so one of the things I, I do early on in the book is try to establish the fact that uh, there is this kerygma, there is this early Christian message, uh, and it goes right back to the beginning of the apostolic preaching. Uh, so it's it's uh, has great antiquity and it's spread right across the New Testament. So those two points, both the antiquity and the great spread, uh, highlight the historical importance of this early Christian message, not just mm-hmm. the I happen to be interested in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought beginning with uh, Paul's articulation in 1 Corinthians 15, as he passes on something of first importance, uh, is a particularly clear articulation of those elements that you work through in the book. Uh, but you spend some time also, as you you were just mentioning, making the argument that the broader early Christian reception of the preached word was not a literary allusion necessarily to Paul's letter uh, uh-huh. that Paul's Paul himself is articulating something uh, that has been passed down. Yeah, absolutely. I, one one of the things I draw want to draw attention to and express a bit playfully is the fact that uh, there's a there's a canon in the sense of a a standard of teaching. That's what a, well, that's what a canon originally means. It does, canon isn't originally doesn't originally mean a collection of books, but it means a a yardstick or a cat or or a, mm-hmm. a, a touchstone. Uh, that there's a, a canon of what Christian teaching is, even before any Christians wrote anything. Mm-hmm. So before, so there were just as there was a preached gospel before the gospels, plural. Uh, there is there is a, a canon, a, a yardstick of of what you know is and isn't Christian teaching mm-hmm. uh, before there's a a biblical canon uh, or a New Testament canon of with the collection of of of, of all the books in. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the uh, the notion of a rule of faith that was present uh, in the early Christian community, one of the pushbacks on that is that there's variances in the components or the wording of the rule of faith as someone like Irenaeus or uh, Justin or Tertullian uh, articulates this. But um, in in some ways that would be expected if this was a a rule of faith that it wasn't necessarily a, a quotation of a creed, but a drawing upon a um a kerygma uh, that was taught and was a feature of the textual community uh, in the earliest churches does that kind of also resonate with kind of the approach that you're taking here yeah absolutely so so i suppose what i'm what i identify as the kerygma or the the earliest rule of faith uh is is simply a sort of positive account of the gospel of what, mm-hmm. the, what the good news is, um, that Christ died for our sins and uh, and that Christ was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. So that is simply, the good news is simply a declaration of what God has done. Mm-hmm. 
Then as, as rules of faith develop, they develop to deal with misinterpretations of that gospel message. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, you know, the most well-known and one of the, among the earliest of these is, is Paul's letter to the Galatians, where he spells out how to interpret the good news as something which requires circumcision is actually a, a travesty of the gospel, a distortion version of the gospel and so uh paul in a in a sense creates or, or adds to the rule of faith that there are certain things that the gospel doesn't mean mm -hmm. uh, which weren't in weren't imagined at the beginning again when we come on to the, the first letter of john uh we we have w first john or one john as we call it in the uk uh, <laughs> dealing with a, a misinterpretation of who christ is that if there's a, an understanding of christ as uh, somehow separate from the human being who came in the who, who was in the flesh that there's a sort of separation between a spiritual jesus and a, a and a physical jesus then that again is a um is according to uh, according to one john something that comes from the antichrist that's something which you need to have in place um to make sure that you don't misunderstand the gospel and that's what's happened through the, the through the history of christian creeds and so if we think about something that you, you can read the uh the Ap the apostles creed simply as a sort of positive statement mm -hmm. uh, of christian doctrine but actually, when you say, if you say in church, you know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that just sound, that sounds on, on one level just like good Christian stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's also got a polemic in it. It's saying that the one God, that the supreme God, the Father, is the maker of heaven and earth because lots of people, well, not I don't know about lots of people, sure. but various heretical Christian groups didn't think mm -hmm. that. They thought that there was one God the Father above everyone else, and that there was a lower deity who was the maker of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so right the way through the history of Christian creeds, we see those positive state, we see a load of positive statements, but which also often have a sort of polemical edge to them because they're designed to guard, you know, designed not just to state positive Christian truth, but to guard against uh, Christian falsehood as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. And, uh, in this discussion too, that's a helpful example as we're thinking through the first articulation of an idea doesn't necessarily mean that that was the first uh, or the first specific articulation of, a, of an idea like God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth is not necessarily the first time that that belief was established. Right. Um, so as the, you know, sometimes I work with students tell, thinking through this idea of like, um, if if there's if the response in early Christianity is that someone has someone or some teaching has challenged the status quo, there had to be a quo to begin with um, to challenge uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And so some of that development seems to work like that as well. You mentioned uh, here just kind of uh, interacting with airmen and specifically, but just kind of this general notion that the coherence of the apostolic uh, teaching or preaching the kerygma is a result of a fourth century articulation and then kind of retrojection back on the earliest uh, centuries um, that matthew mark luke and john read the way that someone would expect it to among the proto-orthodox and you make the point that uh, that's true uh, but the broader argument of your book is that the reason why that takes place is because this was part of not just the reception of the gospels but the composition of the gospels mm -hmm. uh, i thought that was a, a a really strong uh connection because that kind of taps into the uh study of canon formation or just the uh the nature of theological development and the historical development of early christianity yeah, quite. So, so, so on, on the one hand, yeah, if you're looking from the fourth century back on the Gospels, um, then you, you, you can you can say, well, the Gospels um, uh, cohere with the sort of creedal orthodoxies of the fourth century. Um, but on the other hand, you can, uh, and that, and that creedal orthodoxy 
partly coheres with the gospels because they the, that creed orthodoxy ha, it, you know has received the gospels and been shaped by the gospels um but on the other hand the gospels themselves are examples of reception the gospels themselves mm-hmm. are are um receptions of the the preached gospel so in a way just to put it put it in 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 similar terms it's not just looking back on looking back from the fourth century into the second half of the second century when gospels were written if that's when they were written um mm. uh, but the 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 gospels from the second half of the, the first century are looking are 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 receptions of the kerygma the gospel message in the first half of the, from the first half mm-hmm. of the first century um so rather than looking back from a later vantage point what i'm really doing is is moving forward uh through the first century identifying first of all the early apostolic message mm-hmm. and then moving forward to the, the the composition of the new testament gospels and looking at how they how they take take in how they um follow that uh that early preached message as well as how the non gospels uh partly follow and partly dis- partly deviate mm-hmm. from that message Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, this kind of overlaps with something we've already kind of talked about, but I was going to see if you had um, any last thoughts, because I, th- I thought one of the clear strengths of your project as a whole is your careful attention to method and the nature of comparative study when navigating such a range of early Christian texts. So you you mentioned um, in the same place we were talking about before, that holistic comparison is methodologically unsustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you, what do you mean by this specifically? And then what do you think is at stake in this orienting starting point? Well, I think, I think, I think it's uh, really what I was saying earlier about how y- you can't just compare Matthew and Mark mm-hmm. in general, uh, y- you know, because the, potential for comparison is pretty much endless um you could compare that you know i could you could easily list 10 things that 10 ways in which you could you could compare them in terms of their you know individual features of their language their the use of greek you could compare them on any given theological topic uh you could compare them with respect to their um all the instances in which they've been interpreted. Um, so you you can't just compare one thing and another in their totality. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, going back to our discussion earlier, that's why I say why I sort of make it clear that, uh, and I'm not I'm not the first person to do this. I'm the, sure. This is a, a common a common complaint that people make. Uh, um, that that, that uh, you have to have a a clear criterion of comparison. You have to have a clear what I what I term a comparator. Um, mm-hmm. What Jonathan Z. Smith calls the with respect to. If you're comparing one thing and another, you have to compare them both with respect to a third thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, y- you know you're engaging in this kind of rather mystical <laughs> right. comparison of two whole entities, which which is yeah. impossible. Well, I thought this was, you can kind of see this initially as you're thinking about the canonical Gospels, but then as you move towards kind of comparing, contrasting broader texts, you can kind of see the payoff of this kind Mm -hmm. of the explanatory power as you're thinking. If you were just comparing, say, uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Thomas, um, and genre was your specific criteria, it would seem like those were completely separate um, entities. Uh, and you might draw some broader conclusions there. But if you're thinking specifically about a particular aspect, uh, then you can kind of see something. uh, It's a more robust comparison and contrast, uh, whereas if you were only having that kind of holistic comparison, you might never ask the question, are there elements here that actually are closer or further apart than I thought initially? Yeah, I, I, I think partly... Partly my um, desire to have a sort of methodological rigor was that I think, you know, on both sides uh, of, of of the debate, there there is um, 
rather sort of superficial comparison. So for for pretty orthodox Christians, there's a, an obvious temptation to look at the canonical gospels and the canon uh, and the, the apocryphal gospels and say, well, the canonical gospels are kind of normal, and the apocryphal gospels mm-hmm. are weird. Um, and that that's a that's a that's a common you know um, way that people sometimes talk. You know, pe- people talk about you know Christians talk about the apocryphal gospels. Um, on, on the other hand, there's a similar mistake from the from the opposite end which is to say that the uh th- that there's no real difference there's no fundamental difference between the canonical gospels and the non-canonical gospels they're all part of the same sort of mush there's all they're all part of the sort of melting pot of early christianity and that you can't draw any meaningful distinctions between them so i i suppose it's those they that um I'm partly fighting a war on two fronts, which I know is always mm-hmm. yeah. an interesting to do <laughs> yeah. um, um, against uh, against those those two sort of extremes. Yeah, I thought that that specific aspect of your work was helpful. Um, uh, personally, I uh, tend towards just thinking uh, of those broad comparisons um, just in general, not just in this particular question, um, but having worked through, you know, the scholarly discussions in various ways, kind of, uh, and I think a lot of uh, scholars in a confessional context or just uh, churchmen have a lingering uh, sense, some stronger than others, but that the um, the history of early Christianity and the apocryphal gospels or the early Christian gospel, gospel texts are important, but really kind of uh, been cut, cut our teeth on historical analysis in this uh, in a different way. So I thought what your book uh, helped for someone coming from that direction is uh, it, ge- it, ge- it gives a set of tools uh, in order to kind of think about, well, what would be the uh, comparison and contrast? What would that look like? Um, and so that's I, I appreciated part one and part three uh, of your book, which is uh, sometimes missing in some of these discussions, uh, whereas the bulk of your book, of course, is working through the the, the text on their own terms, but mm-hmm. with a specific focus here. Um, so as you're thinking about the project as a whole, are there any specific examples of connections or insights that arise as a result of this particular approach to studying these gospel texts in early Christianity, perhaps a textual or theological feature in these texts that we might not have noticed if we were using a different approach? Do you mean about the canonical gospels or the or the or any? Yeah, at any point, really, uh, either any the canonical point. gospels. Well, I think or... one of the things what I found particularly interesting actually was working through the two the two texts which are often identified as uh, Valentinian gospels. So uh, Va- Val- the Valentinian school in the second century or beginning in the second century uh, had as its founder uh, a theologian, you know. Uh, heretical theologian Valentinus, um, who was an interesting figure because he wasn't an extreme uh, Gnostic. Uh, he wasn't a, a Gnostic as such. Um, I'll get into what some of these terms mean later, if you if you like. Um, but he sort of take he'd taken the the really extreme heresy of the Gnostic school and tried to sort of moderate it by making it more biblical, um, making it perhaps more acceptable to um, to Christians. And so as a result, the, the two the two texts which emerge from the Valentinian school of thought are the Gospel of Truth and the Gospel of Philip, as well as as well as other non-gospel texts, which um, uh, um, I haven't discussed in this book. And Interestingly, you know, these two texts are different from the canonical gospels insofar as they don't really see the death uh, of Jesus as in fulfillment of scripture. They have a slightly unusual view of the resurrection and don't regard that as as a sort of scriptural event, uh, a scriptural fulfillment either. But on the other hand, they do they do have a very strong sense that the death of Jesus accomplishes salvation, uh, and so in that respect, they're they're quite like the 
non-canonical gospels they have they have a very strong concern to to show that how the death of jesus is an as an is an event of revelation it's an event in which the um uh the the sort of deceitfulness of the of the of the cosmos is um is uncovered and uh people uh, can come to a knowledge of God, um, and so the, the the gospel of truth and the gospel of Philip are, I think, interesting cases of how these apocryphal gospels are not are not just, you know, completely different mm -hmm. from the canonical gospels, uh, because after after all, what you know, the argument in my book is not that the canonical gospels share all the features of this early kerygma and the apocryphal gospels have none of the features of this mm. kerygma. The, the, the key point is that these apocryphal gospels, the non-canonical gospels, um, have some, but not all of the the key features of this early mm. kerygma. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I itemize the the elements of the kerygma, uh, it, you know, into sort of four parts from this formula christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and rose again on the third day according to the script you know jesus is the christ the subject of the sentence um he's the jewish messiah um so that's the first point second his death is a, a saving event um third the resurrection too is a saving event that they're both part both integral to the gospel and fourthly that um the death and resurrection are both acts of events of scriptural um prophet you know fulfillments mm -hmm. of scripture prophecy um and so you know when when we come to these valentinian gospels the gospel of truth and the gospel of philip they're you know way away from uh the kerygma when it comes to you know seeing the jesus events as fulfillments of prophecy but on the other hand that you know they're quite similar to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in regarding the death of Jesus as a central event of saving significance. Yeah, I thought that um, that was one of the things that I had noted that was interesting about this. The comparative approach here is that here's two gospels that are gospel texts that are in some in some sense equally distant from the canonical gospels, but in some areas, uh, you know, essentially grouped together according to these criteria. Um, especially if you kind of make the distinction within kind of uh, what we think of as Gnosticism between mm -hmm. the Valentinian theology kind of being expressed in Philip and the Gospel of Truth, where something like the classic Gnosticism uh, where you're, that you get in something like Gospel of Judas yeah. or the Coptic Gospel of the Egyptians. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought that was kind of interesting, and it circled back to the uh, point you make earlier in your book that the broader claim you're making is that the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have these similarities uh, because they're reflecting a proto-Orthodox understanding of the gospel in the same way that you can kind of group Judas and the Egyptian gospel because they have this underlying connection to mm -hmm. a social or theological context. Uh, so I thought that was a, a helpful way, not just to say the what is distinctive about the gospels, but also to kind of help navigate your way through what could seem like a just amorphous, unending collection of of non canonical texts. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I think I think some you know some of them do. I think it's you know some really important work has been done over the last hundred years, in particular, I think, in the last few decades, and you know really identifying um, the profile of the Valentinian school. Uh, Aina Thomason, a, a Norwegian scholar, has done, a, you know, written a brilliant book on on this theme. Um, and similarly, David Brackey has re recently written a great book on the Gnostics, identifying their particular theological profile. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so, so so I think you know, just as the Valentinian school is quite a broad church, uh, as it were, it's quite a uh, um, you know through its through its history, it had splits and. Mm -hmm schisms just like lots of other churches um it, it's a broad movement rather than a you know a group of people who met in the same building every sunday or right like that it's similarly the 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 sort of proto-orthodox if that's uh, a good term for them uh 
is a similarly broad group uh, and that broad group embraced the plurality of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I think the reason why that's that that's maybe sort of um, uncomfortable for some scholars is because as scholars, we're so sort of used to looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John down the microscope and looking and thinking of them as um, as as having very different theological outlooks um, and you know written in competition with one another, perhaps. Um, that, uh, but but actually, when we look at them, you know, from another point of view, they actually look very similar to one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So seeing the not just unity or diversity, but the the kind of unity and diversity among these texts versus the kind of unity and diversity among uh, other most other texts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, if I'm one of my favorite examples, or just some some of those connections that your your categories gave me, is one connection that the really drove home for me was the prominence of both the identification of Jesus as the Christ and also the argument that Jesus's death specifically fulfilled the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, so as you note, at several places, sometimes a gospel text, a non-canonical gospel text, has some strong or loose connections to the kerygma. But then when you get to that last factor of uh, scriptural fulfillment, you see uh, a direct opposition to the or absence of the notion of scriptural fulfillment. Mm -hmm. um, so as kind of we've been talking about, some of these texts are really strong or at the, at the very least include some of these elements. Uh, but one of the striking ones that I noticed as I made my way through the book is uh, the way that you're pointing out scriptural fulfillment becoming one of one of those uh, determining factors for specific texts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you, you're absolutely right that it, it's it's opposition or, or absence, and 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 one finds both among the collection of texts that are, that I looked at. So if you look, for example, at the Gospel of Truth. Um, it's striking how there are lots of allusions to the New Testament, but there, there's no sense uh, in the Gospel of Truth that that the events of of, of Jesus coming and dying are are fulfilments of any any prior scripture existing outside of the, mm -hmm. the text of the Gospel of Truth. Um, so that's a that's a, a good example of absence. Um, on the other hand, if you look in the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, I mean, at the same time, in the Gospel of Truth, there's no, there's nothing um, there's nothing said against the Old Testament. It's, mm -hmm. it's just it's just ignored. Um, whereas when we come to the Gospel of Thomas, uh, there's a clear statement in in Gospel of Thomas saying fifty two that uh, Scripture is something which is um, not just irrelevant to uh, the understanding of of, of Jesus, but uh, actually something which is is harmful. Um, so in saying 52, the disciples come along and they uh, they say to Jesus, 24 prophets spoke in Israel. Did all did all of them speak about you? Um, and uh, Jesus reply, you've neglected the living one in front of you and spoken of the dead. Mm -hmm. So the uh, scriptural authors are identified as the dead. Which in the Gospel of Thomas is not just a statement about their you know, rot, they're rotting in the grave, but it, the death is a sort of spiritual condition in the Gospel of Thomas. Um, that they're on, they're on the side of the, they're on the side of evil, um, and they're in opposition to the living one in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. That's that, that, that is Jesus. So, one finds both in, you know, in the apocryphal Gospels both um, a sort of neglect of Scripture and. Uh, an actual opposition to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that uh, category of, of absence was, uh, I've encountered this, of course, in other places, but the way you brought it together as part of the analytical task, I thought was really helpful because it to note absence, it takes some text, you, there has to be some textual uh, indications that might lead you to expect that um, feature, and then its absence is uh, more striking or meaningful uh, if there's something in that text that would lead you to believe that this should be in the gospel or in the text. And then if it's absence, it's like, as you mentioned, uh, the Sherlock Holmes is uh, the dog that didn't bark. Uh, yeah. And that yeah. being something that I should have heard this and I didn't. Uh, 
um, that requires a working knowledge of that text and uh, what you're comparing it with, of course. Uh, so I thought that category of absence uh, being included with both similarity and difference uh, was a helpful, a helpful additional tool. Yeah, I think I think the first time this really occurred to me was when I, you know, long time ago, 2006, I was I was writing a book on a short, you know, a short book on the Gospel of Judas when it first came out. And it sort of struck me that I, I don't know. I don't know what sort of led me to realize this. Um, I suppose just being absorbed in the text for over a, over a month or so, a month or two. Mm-hmm. Um, that um, there's no reference to any to, to love in the Gospel of, of Judas. There's no love that the Father expresses towards the Son. There's no love that God expresses towards the world. Uh, there's no love that is expected among among the disciples uh, of Jesus or um, for for one another or for, for for God, and and that that you know it suddenly hit me that that was a, a sort of pretty striking absence, mm. um, considering the amount of you know the quantity of references to love all across early Christian literature, um, and so that's partly what makes the mood of of the gospel of judas very different from mm-hmm. uh the, the 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 kind of um emotional uh life that you see reflected in, in you know in, in lots of you know even in valentinian texts um mm-hmm. uh, other more straightforward early christian literature um and so so that 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 was, I think, when I first realised that there were some significant absences in the um, non-canonical gospels, and and you know I don't focus on that particular theme in this book, but um, I, I think I that you know there are certain th- certain things that are not just coincidental absences. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so when, when you have a a book like the Gospel of Thomas, which is is seeking to set out, you know, the good news. Um, it starts off by, um, by 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 saying that these are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas wrote down. Whoever finds the interpretations of these sayings will not taste death. You know, th- th- this is what offers you eternal life. Um, and so, if you have a a gospel setting out to do that. In the case of the Gospel of Thomas, to to have no reference to Jesus as, uh, you know, no ref- no use at all of the title Christ, is pretty striking. It seems like it seems mm. like it's not just a coincidental absence, um, um, you know, like um, there's no reference to the word for water in Romans. I mean, that's just one of those things <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in, the, in Paul's letter to the Romans. That's just one of those things. And there are lots of, you know, absences that are just one of those things. Mm-hmm. But the absence of, of a reference to Jesus as Christ in the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of, of, of Judas um, is, I think, more than just one of those things. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a sort of a, a significant silence. Mm-hmm. Um, a telling absence. Before we move past this kind of uh, question, I thought um, there was throughout the the book, the beginning, uh, your intro and conclusion, but in several of the, the chapters, because of the nature of the text that you were looking at, I thought it was a very insightful reminder that the term Messiah was significant, of course, uh, the Christ, but perhaps more significant or important was the way that the title was used in context and <laughs> and if it was connected to an exegetical tradition that engaged the network of messianic texts and themes from the Hebrew Bible. Uh-huh. Um, so here you maybe you have a a text that uses the title Christ, but is not showing any awareness uh, of the way in which the gospel, the canonical gospels utilize that, which is usually a connection to an exegetical tradition about Psalm 2 or Psalm 110, for example. I thought that was a very helpful explanatory tool uh, because in you know one of the gospels it, it used the Christ or a, a messianic um, concept like king of Israel or something, but it was clear that it was not connecting that to a the network of uh, or the exegetical tradition from the Old Testament scriptures. 
Yeah, that's right. So, 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 in the case of those Valentinian texts, the Gospel of Truth and the and the, and the Gospel of um, uh, of Philip, uh, you have a you know pretty strong emphasis on, especially in the Gospel of Philip, and a strong emphasis on the on the title Christ. Um, but as you say, it's it's not connected up with any of the Jewish messianic uh, tradition, drawing which draws on. Uh, on the Old Testament to illuminate that Christ, that concept of of who the Christ is, um, for for the for the Valentinians um, and the, and the Gospel texts of of Philip and Truth, that there's a there's a an interest in the fact that the Greek word and the Hebrew word, the Greek word Christ and the Hebrew word Messiah, are tied up with anointing, and Actually, the Hebrew word Mashiach, uh, you could say it also uh, is related to um, not just a verb, Mashach, meaning anointed, anoint, anoint, but another verb, Mashach, Hebrew verb, which means to measure, mm-hmm. or uh, uh, an Aramaic word meaning to measure. Uh, and so for the for the Gospel of Philip, this sort of set, sets him off on one uh, sort of exploration of how the Christ, how Jesus is, a, how Jesus is a measurement of the Father, mm-hmm. um, and so the the Valentinian texts exploit the sort of the etymology, the sort of um, uh, the verbal connections that um, the ter- the Christ term and Messiah term have with with other sort of fields of mm-hmm. language, uh, and use those sort of for theologically created purposes but then they don't connect christ and messiah up with uh mm-hmm. jewish messianic tradition okay yeah that, i think that's a really helpful uh tool uh, another tool of analysis and it also is one of those things that made me appreciate what the uh, matthew mark luke and john are doing uh despite their uh, diversity uh with the concept of messiah um in messianic texts there uh, before we before we move on from um, kind of just my some of my favorite uh, parts of your book, uh, I did want to ask you about probably the only time I laughed out loud when I was reading it. I don't know if this was intentional, but when you're discussing the Gospel of Peter, um, you're, you're kind of working through the idea of the you know when the resurrection account that it's a giant Jesus as his face is all the way in the clouds and above the heavens, mm-hmm. uh, and you m- mentioned that this was a uh, literally a literal high Christology. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just really appreciated that uh, comment uh, brought together several things with me. Uh, obviously not not as a, as a scholarly perspective, you know, as a reader, but I, I, I did appreciate that. So. <laughs> Thanks. Um, a smaller but related project, uh, last year you published a volume of fresh translations of the Apocryphal Gospels with Penguin hmm. Classics. Um, so in light of some of your more academic analysis of these works, you know, putting them in, a, in an accessible format that someone, you know, might just pick up at Barnes and Noble or something, uh, what would you say is the broader value of reading these early Christian texts, either for students, church members, or casual readers of the New Testament? Well, I think I think for Christians, one of the things that uh, I've I've felt for a while is that we we don't need to be sort of afraid of these texts um that that i think sometimes people are a bit nervous about uh you know maybe there was some kind of conspiracy to uh you know to suppress these texts and um you know get rid of texts which really should have been in the canon but end up not being in the canon and um but 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 I think when you, one of the things you know it's not just a translation of the text but it's also I've also provided an, an, a sort of introduction to the whole mm. world and uh, little introductions to the individual texts as well um, and I, I've tried to sort of frame these translations in a way that will make clear that, that there's there's nothing for, for Christians to be worried about in 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 looking at these texts. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, some of the some of the texts are by no means sort of heretical. It, it's, it's not that all the apocryphal gospel, all, all the apocryphal gospels are, um, are, are you know deliberate attempts to subvert the truth. If if one looks um, at say um, the infancy texts, um, they're not really gospels in the sense of 
set it seeking to set out the um uh a, a sort of saving message um they don't start off being called gospels um mm. but a text like the infancy gospel of thomas and the proto evangelium of james are really attempts to sort of tell pious legends about jesus to bolster some of the 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 sort of more orthodox claims at least claims that they were orthodox in some circles mm -hmm. uh, so that you know one could deduce from the gospel of thomas that you know there wasn't a particular moment uh either at the baptism of jesus or at his resurrection when jesus became the son of, became adopted as the son of god um that actually jesus had divine power all along even when he was a child and so he was able to turn pieces of clay into birds and mm -hmm. and heal his friends when they fell off the tops of roofs or um, <laughs> things like that um and similarly the, the post evangelium of james um i suppose is what one might call a more sort of catholic <laughs> text in that it's uh, very emphatic about the perpetual virginity of mary even after mm -hmm. um, she'd given birth to jesus um uh, and so um uh the emphasis on the purity of mary is very prominent in that text mm -hmm. as well as uh, on jesus himself so uh i suppose the attempt you know this my my book only my bigger book only discusses seven uh, apocryphal gospels um and gospels of the sort which seek to set out the, a saving message of jesus um the my apocryphal gospels volume is a much broader volume which uh, uh includes translations of Texts which you know might well not really be gospels, but which are sort mm -hmm. of gospel-like texts or gospel-like material, um, and uh, um, there's a great diversity of that kind of stuff, um, mm -hmm. which, which ranges from you know pretty uh, pious Orthodox legend uh, to the kinds of texts like the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel mm -hmm. of Thomas, which are much more subversive in their intentions. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about kind of the scholarly uh, positions on some of these texts in relation to the Gospels or early Christianity. But uh, I think that one of the unique and help, very helpful things about this little this uh, book is that it uh, one it helps uh, kind of situate um, all of these with the introductions, and you kind of point out what some of the unique, distinctive features of each of these texts is. But for someone who, on a popular level, is either overemphasizing the value of these texts or you know seeing them in some sort of mystically different than uh, any other early christian text and then also someone who is arguing that they're to be neglected or uh, dangerous uh, this volume kind of helps uh, kind of introduce and de-scandalize the the study of these texts um, so you have for someone that thinks they're not important reading through here and it's like there's some oh there's some very substantive texts here but for someone who's thinking that there was a sea of uh, hundreds of texts that look exactly like matthew mark and luke showing what those texts are a lot of them fragmentary or you know some of the uh, oxyrhynchus papyri um just uh, snippets of things it kind of helps kind of mediate uh, mm -hmm. both of those on a, a popular level so i thought that was particularly helpful helpful as well yeah, C.S. Lewis says in his introduction to the Screwtape Letters that there are two equal and opposite dangers one can fall into when discussing the devil. Either you can completely, you know, disbelieve in the devil and ignore the devil, or you can take an unhealthy interest in the devil. And mm -hmm. you know, the same is true of the uh, apocryphal gospels, I think. That's a good word. That's a good word. Um, well, I want to respect your time. My concluding question is usually uh, what I like to ask here, kind of a ge more general reflective question, that there's a lot going on in the world that is discouraging uh, that we could think of and point to, but what is something that gives you hope? Well, I think I think to to stick with the theme of um, uh, my book, I mean, the, the gospel is what gives us hope, mm -hmm. the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection as the, uh, as the, the foundation on which we can uh, live in the present and also have uh expectation of of, of of for the future as well um so so that's on, on a kind of more um objective level i think you know in my own 
impression as well as you say there are lots of terrible things that are going on all the time but um i am also though heartened by the fact that you, you know the various places i travel around in the uk and the us and and other other places as well the the number of churches that are engaged in planting churches and spreading spreading the good news uh, through planting churches in particular is something which uh, has been a great encouragement to me over the last few years. Well, that's, that's very, very good. Very helpful. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, your work has helped me in so many ways in this latest book on the Gospels in early Christianity. has already led to new insights and good conversations with students and colleagues, so very much appreciate it. Great. I'm really pleased to hear that. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Chad. See you.